You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. This is the Huddle Up Podcast presented as always by Mile High Huddle. Powered by Blue Wire Pods, and I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me is my fellow football priest and the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach, before I get to the unique records uh, Teddy produced on in, in week two, I got to let you know, I went ahead and fell on the proverbial sword today, eating my crow in public with a written article saying, look, Teddy Bridgewater, so far through two games, has made Vic Fangio – look like the smartest guy in the room after his controversial decision to uh, roll with Teddy over Drew. Do you agree with me on that? Am I jumping the gun and yeah. tell everybody what the, what I'll, I'll pull it up at the records Teddy broke or set or whatever from week two. Well, I think it's easy to look like the smartest man in the room when, you know, you're paired up against the Jacksonville Jaguars and the New York giants and I give Teddy all the credit in the world, and I give the Broncos scouting department for identifying Teddy Bridgewater all the credit in the world for how it's gone for two games. But it's still only two games, and those two games were against, I would say, inferior competition. He will make a complete fan out of me, and I will swallow the sword, fall on the sword, swallow the crow, whatever word, expression you want to use when he beats the Baltimore Ravens, if he beats the Baltimore Ravens, if he takes down Kansas City, or at least goes toe-to-toe with Kansas City. I can't flex that much over a whooping on the Giants and the Jaguars, two teams that look like they're competing for the number one overall pick in next year's draft. So compared to that metric, yeah, they look like geniuses, but I'm not going to completely sell out my feelings or my um, my <clears throat> mindset on the quarterback battle because they took down two teams that even – Drew Locke, I think, could have taken down, Chad. You know, yeah. I, I, not to take anything away from Teddy, but it's still two games, and it's still the Giants and the Jaguars. I think the season for Teddy and the Broncos starts in week four against Baltimore when the competition is at least a couple levels higher. We have a very generous super chat opening things up real quick, and then I want to get back to this. Michaela, the Duchess, hey, it's only a few more days till we get to finally meet you in the flesh, and we cannot wait we're hoping your swag that is coming your way gets there in time. Um, let us know when you do get it. But thank you so much for that very generous support, my friend. You know we do appreciate it. Much love to you. It just blows us away. She says, I feel bad for Jerry Judy. Um, where'd it go? I feel bad for Jerry Judy. Uh, on the other hand, I'm excited to see what just, or sorry, Josie Jewell what Sternad brings to the table. Can't wait for the tailgate. So Zach, yes, that's the other, we'll come back to Teddy here in just a moment. You reported today for us at milehighhuddle.com, Josie Jewell done for the season, which yeah. it, I mean, it's like he, he makes that huge hit on special teams, right? Gets up and like flexes on the dude. I wonder if that's where it tore or if it was the hit itself. It was almost like, what was that kicker? Do you remember the kicker that tore his ACL uh, celebrating? Grammatica? I think it was Grammatica. I hope it wasn't a situation like that, but either way, it's quite a blow. And not just because, te- you know, Josie Jewell was off to a really good start. I mean, he was playing well in that game, had a solid game one, but he's in a contract year, man. And you hate to see any player, a starter in particular, go down like that in a contract year. I think you kind of nailed it, though, how I feel. What was a starter doing on special teams? Though? What was Josie Jewell doing playing special teams? So to me, one thing I've noticed about the last few months, and especially after the preseason when the Broncos had their special teams disasters, they've way overcompensated for Tom McMahon. They brought in players like Jonah Griffith and Mike Ford to help out the unit, uh, and they were playing apparently Josie Jewell, a starting inside linebacker on special teams. What for? That's why you have backups. That's why you have the Sternod. That's why you have the Jonas Griffiths of the world. I don't understand their thinking. It sucks for Josie Jewell, J- Josie Jewell, though. He was playing really terrific football. I mean, he was a hammer. 
I think in both, um, and obviously in run support, but he was getting after the quarterback and he was flying around with a speed I haven't seen in a few years out of him. Sucks for him, but it's the next man up, and this is the time now for Sternod and Baron Browning to prove the Broncos scouting department correct. Thank God for depth. Depth will save the day. That's right. That's right. Here's what Fangio said about basically it was very subtly hinted around hey so you know Josie's your starting linebacker and the guy literally calling the signals for you on defense what's he doing on special teams uh quote we've made a commitment to improve our special teams we have a few guys that do that that play on special teams who are considered starters we're just looking to make our special teams better when I was in San Francisco linebacker former all pro Navarro Bowman who was all pro all three years and contending for defensive player of the year, covered every single punt for three years in San Francisco, close quote. So that's Fangio's defense. Now, Zach, on one hand, can we really criticize again, Michaela, love you. Thank you. Can we really criticize Fangio for playing Josie Jewell on a punt coverage when at the same time we're out here with our pitchforks demanding the special teams improve? But isn't there a medium? And I was reading that quote. First of all, it really worked out well for Navarro Bowman's career, didn't it, Chad? He had such longevity in the NFL. Second of all, just because you did it one time doesn't make this time right. You know, one thing doesn't really counteract the other here. You can improve special teams by improving the scheme, by improving the coaching. But Fangio has such a, I don't know the PG word for it, Chad. He has a raging affinity for Mm -hmm. Tom McMahon, and he's willing to close his eyes and and cover his ears no matter what goes on on special teams. If you improve the scheme, improve the coaching, I guarantee you, you won't see these kick return touchdowns, but they don't want to do that. They want to keep shuffling players through and putting the onus on players and putting starters out there, and now they lost one for the entire year because of that, directly because of Tom McMahon's futility. That's why Josie Jewell is no longer playing this year. It's a very unfortunate break. For what it's worth, Navarro Bowman, Drafted in 2010, started one game. Then Fangio arrived alongside um, Harbaugh in 2011. 16-game starter, three years in a row. All-pro each of those years. Pro Bowl two of those years. Then he tore his ACL in 14 and MCL. In 15, uh, Fangio now is in Chicago. He comes back to San Fran, uh, starts 16 games. Pro Bowl, all-pro again. And then the next year, injury bug jumps up and bites him. Uh, four starts. He ends up moving on. Final year in the league, 2017, split in time with the Raiders and the Niners. So I see exactly what you mean by that. I really do. Um, guys, there's more, to, so much more, so much more to talk about. We got a lot to get to. All right. But first, hey, we got to say thank you to the presenting sponsor of tonight's live stream podcast. And you might have guessed it. That is BetQL. Guys, listen, if you're trying to make your Sunday football viewing experience, all the more interesting. Maybe try and win a little, uh, you know, a few dollars along the way. You're probably one amongst the throng in the United States who have really jumped on this this new gambling wave with teams teaming up with sports books and, you know, as official sponsors. Like we're living in a whole new era. If you are doing that and you want to make sure that you give yourself the best possible chance to win your bets, all right, you've got to get with BetQL, all right? Download the app, BetQL, whether it's Apple uh, Apple Store or the uh, Google Play, because they have the best bets computer model. And what that does is it scans over 350,000 unique bets per year to give you the best bet recommendation for each game. It's across all sports. And basically what that does is they've already done the research. They've already done the analytics gives you the logic, the reasoning, the strategy behind why you should or shouldn't place a bet, all right? Their algorithm in the first week went 13-2 and on their five-star bets in week one, all right, utilizing the best bets algorithm. So it covers everything, does BetQL's model and their tools, from spreads to over and unders and even player prop bets. Zach, it's basically the same thing as NFL teams utilizing tools, analytics tools like Pro Football Focus to give them that edge on game day. 
Exactly. Everyone loves data. It's the new buzzword around the sports landscape, and BetQL provides the sharp data so you can see who the pros are backing, as well as line movement so you can jump on betting opportunities in real time with BetQL, which also offers team summaries highlighting previous success against the spread and the over-under, as well as the breaking news when lineups change and injury statuses are updated. Plus, this is really important, Broncos country. You can save all of your picks in one place to track your success and winning streaks and view your rank on their betql's leaderboards that's right guys that's right so give yourself the betting edge on game day head to the app store or google play right now download the betql app if you're on a browser you can head to try.betql.co slash mhh or the easiest thing to do to make sure you get a discount on those tools is at checkout in the app, use the code MHH, and you will get 25% off any of BetQL's subscription offerings. Yeah, last thing, Broncos country, be sure to check out BetQL's BetMGM offer in the description of this video below in order to receive a free year of BetQL and download the BetQL app. Use the code MHH at checkout for 25% off and arm yourself with all the weapons you need to beat your bookie on game day. All right, guys, we're going to dive right back into the content, but I know many of our community members are uh, pining to see where we're at in the uh, contest for the Justin Simmons jersey. We're doing a contest both on Facebook and YouTube. Here's where we're at. We're trying to reach 250,000 stars as a goal in the month of September. When? I'm going to use that as it's an assumptive uh, win, okay? When we hit 250,000 stars, we're going to raffle off a Justin Simmons jersey, all right? And the only people in the running for that jersey are the people who contributed stars to the goal. Now, here we are, Zach. It's day 20 in the month. We got some ground to make up. We're, we're doing really well. I mean, and all of this is phenomenal. It blows our minds. But we're at 53%, and obviously more than 50% of the month is in the book. So where do things stand? Who's in the running if we hit goal? Like, oh, when we hit goal. Here's the leaderboard for this month, all right? Uh, Samisi Muti at the top, Michael Ronquillo at two, Zeus McPeak at three, Randy Jones at four, Joshua Shadow at five, Travis Weber at six, Gary Leeds Palmer seven, Claude Riley eight, Chris Hernandez nine, and Shane Daniels at 10. And then you can just kind of see a few of the names just outside the, the top 10. All right. As long as it's 500 stars, you qualify for the drawing for the giveaway when it, when it uh, comes around. And we're also, Zach, we're doing it on YouTube as well. We don't want any of our great supporters across our platforms feeling left out in the cold. The way we're doing it on YouTube, though, because unfortunately YouTube's analytics aren't quite as detailed and on point for us as Facebook's are. So we're keeping the records ourselves, and we're doing it this way. The top five finishers on Super Chat by the end of September, those five names get tickets in the hat. We draw, <clears throat> and they all that winner also, Zach, gets a, a uh, Justin Simmons jersey. Here's the leaderboard on, on Super Chat. Michaela Parker, number one. Chris Hernandez, who leapfrogged many studs and superstars to two. Mark Langley, three. Zeus McPeak, a leader on both boards, and Chris at number four. Seth Herman at five. The Queen at six. Just a few people outside. You can see Kiaka, Casey, Brian. So appreciate you guys. Really, we do. And uh, we can't wait to see when we do that drawing who gets the who gets the swag. All right, Zach. Christian jumping in early with the super. Thank you, Christian. Two of them actually back to back that will hit here. He says, do you think Jonathan Cooper could replace Bradley Chubb soon if he can't stay on the field or maybe after the season? What's your answer? We touched on this kind of a similar topic last night. Might have been Christian. I don't remember who asked that question, but what's your answer? Well, I noticed that when Bradley Chubb set out the first game, it wasn't Jonathan Cooper who got the lion's share. He didn't, actually didn't play that much at all. It was Malik Reed that got the starting opportunity opposite Von Miller. Yep. So, you know, Cooper, he's a great prospect to have, and he had a really good summer, but he still was a seventh-round pick, and he's still going to need some time in Fangio's system, time in the NFL to build up his, his – um, conditioning he had that heart ablation issue that, that took some life out of him you know figuratively speaking and he needs some time to gain that back could he be a long-term option you know a lot of people can I think the Broncos have high hopes for him but right now it's Malik Reed as the number three OLB and I think that role is pretty much solidified for the time being here is Christian's second question do you see Peyton Manning trying to buy the Broncos one way or another based on report so there was a report that broke right before the game uh, started yesterday. Zach, um, 
that basically, I think it was Jason Lockham for of CBS Sports saying that uh, Peyton Manning has talked with two different ownership groups trying to kind of gin up a solid team to be in position to buy the Broncos if, when they are sold. Mike Kliss, according to what I heard today, reporting John Elway's doing the same thing, Zach. So could Peyton Manning, is he trying to buy the Broncos? Yeah, we based on reports, that's what we're hearing. How successful he'll be, anyone can tell. Because remember, the team is valued, according to Forbes, at $3.75 billion. That's with a B, dollars, okay? Mm-hmm. Peyton Manning, wealthy man. John Elway, too, wealthy man. Probably even wealthier than Peyton, despite the fact he played in a prior era because of his business interests. He made over $80 million on one uh, business transaction with his dealerships long before he actually got involved in the Broncos for an office. So this dude has dollars, Zach, but coming up with $3.75 billion, yeah. You need an ownership group. You need an actual exactly. billionaire somewhere out there that says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can come be, you know, X minority owner in the, in the team. I'll put up most of the money. You put up your share and then, you know, you run it. That's what I think both these former Broncos Super Bowl winning quarterbacks are angling for. And it doesn't sound like Zach, they're doing it together. Yeah, that was what I was thinking at first when I saw the Manning report and then the Elway report. I thought they were going in like halvesies on the Broncos, putting all their pennies in the, in the middle of the table and seeing if they can stack up. But if they're split, if it's one versus one, they don't have the capital for it, Chad. They just don't. And I think even for a majority stake, is it 25% down on three point whatever billion? I'm no mathematician. That's a lot of freaking money I don't think they have on hand. And if someone like Jeff Bezos, who has more money than God, comes in and says, listen, I want to buy the Broncos, how do you compete with that? He can pay cash right now. He can write a check. It's couch cushion money for him, actually. So, you know, it's it's fun to think about Peyton being the owner of the Broncos or Elway owning the Broncos. If someone like Robert Smith or Jeff Bezos, someone with more liquid capital comes in, it's it's a wrap from there. Before I grab this super chat, uh, we'll do an update on the stars for this stream about halfway th- through the tonight's show. But we're we're seeing some major action on that side of things. So we gotta Zach help me keep an eye out for these names and their questions, comments in the chat. Uh, Samisi, Zeus, Randy, Michael, uh, Gary Leeds, Palmer, Travis Weber, Lawrence, and Travis Tarbox as well, guys. We'll do an update officially here in just a few more minutes, but. Thank you for the support, and we're, we're keeping an eye out for any of your topics here. But here's Joshua Hickey. Thank you, Joshua. He says, losing Josie really hurts. Uh, come Baltimore, that'll be an issue. Maybe they slide Kareem Jackson down to linebacker for a few snaps against the Jets. I love seeing him hit. Yeah, that's one thing that Kareem brings with gusto is that pop, right, that, that heat-seeking missile. But I don't think outside of being like a dimebacker, Zach, in a nickel-type look, you know, when, when you're facing up against offensive linemen in the box where you don't really have the space to kind of skinny around them, you have to engage them and then shed that, figure out through strength, technique, athleticism to shed the block. We're not talking about Zach out on the, per, on the perimeter like you saw Kareem do against the Jaguars where he had that tackle bearing down on him, but he was coming downhill. He did a little shuck like he was a ball carrier almost. Guy went one way, he went the other, wrapped the guy up, big hit, wrapped him up. It's not going to be Kareem that saves the day at linebacker, I guess is my point here, Zach. But Justin Sternod, come on down. You know, I love seeing Kareem Jackson hit. What I don't love seeing him is cover anyone. I know he had the interception yesterday, but he's still a liability there. And let me tell you something. You can beat <laughs> you can beat this Jets team and Zach Wilson, who threw four picks yesterday against the Patriots, really handily. You don't need to move players around. You don't need to worry too much about losing Josie or not having Bradley Chubb in the lineup. With Baltimore, it could be an issue, yeah, but even so, you have Sternod, who had a great preseason. You have Baron Browning, who the Broncos are very high on, despite being a little behind the eight ball. Between those two guys, and we still have Alexander Johnson holding down the Ford ILB. He's still wearing the green dot, relaying the defensive calls from Fangio, and he's your run-stopping hammer. But between Sternod and Baron Browning, two of them should equal one decent pass-covering inside linebacker, and that's all this defense ever needed, Chad. Sam Bam, good to see you, brother. Thank you for the super chat. He says, what's up, Broncos country? Good start to the season. Let's take care of business against the New York Jets. Pray we come away with no more injuries and get ready for the Ravens week four. Go Broncos. 
Yeah, man. We've had in two games, three players hit IR, and it wouldn't surprise me to see Chubb end up by the end of this week heading to short term IR. Fortunately, by the time we heard from Fangio today, we didn't hear he didn't really have any update on Chubb other than yep, re aggravated the uh, the ankle, but. Man, the the luck this team has had the last two seasons with regard to staving off that injury bug, it's just it's been sad. I'd be shocked if they if they played Bradley Chubb against the Jets, and if they do, I would call for Vic Fangio's firing. It's just negligence at that point, Chad. It's incompetence. And, you know, you can frame it one way. It's because of the Broncos' coaching decisions that Bradley Chubb and Josie Jewell are injured. Think about that. They brought back Bradley Chubb too early. He campaigned to play, but Vic Fangio has the power to say, listen, you're not 100%. It's raining in Jacksonville. It's an inferior team. Just wait one more week. So that was their call to play him. He got hurt. Putting Josie on special teams to make up for the deficiencies of Tom McMahon. That's a coaching call. That's the reason, in hindsight, he got hurt. So it's unfortunate, Chad. They lost two of their linebackers through no fault of the linebackers, all on the coaching. Shane, by the way, thank you for that super chat, bro. He's saying Sternod and Browning have to step up. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, Jonathan, good to see you, brother. Appreciate the super chat. He says, I think this team can hang with the best this year. little overlooked, but uh, Stearns, Caden K- uh, K- Stearns, looked good when he played yesterday. I think Ronald Darby lost his starting job to Pat Sertan, and let's go Broncos 3-0 and coming up. Maybe. We'll see. Time will tell on that front. I mean, they're paying – $10 million to Ronald Darby this year. So money talks and you know what walks. Randy, love you, dude. Thank you for the stars, brother. Uh, what's your what's your reaction to that, Zach? Did Sertan already relegate uh, Ronald Darby to the bench by virtue of one game? I think he relegated him to the bench uh, in that Minnesota game when he had a pick six right off the bat. I mean, how do you make a better impression than that? And he comes back, PS2 does, from allowing a touchdown in week one, and he gets an acrobatic, amazing interception in week two in his first NFL start. And what Fangio said, Chad, was kind of telling to me, he said most cornerbacks would get the pass deflection. PS2 got the pass deflection and the INT. So, obviously, that's why they made him the number nine overall pick. Obviously, that's why they have such high hopes in uh, Patrick Sertan. And he could be Ronald Darby now, the most expensive backup cornerback in the league. Just like Graham Glasgow could be the most expensive backup right guard in the league if Natani Muti takes a spot full-time. It's a good problem to have overall. Steven with an interesting question. Thanks for being with us, Steven Tobacco. What do you guys think will happen with the Jewel AJ Johnson contract debate now that Jewel's out for the season? Well, I tell you what, this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but assuming AJ stays healthy, he'll go out and find a contract out there on the open market come the off season. Jewel, meanwhile, is going to struggle to garner that, uh, you know, this a similar contract, but. The Broncos will it favors the Broncos because they can come yes. in and say, "Hey, that was some crap, crappy luck, my friend. You know, this is below maybe what your market value would have been had you not gotten hurt. But why don't you come back and on a prove it deal, even if yes. it's a one year deal, and see if you can, you know, get right health wise and come back to where you were. That's more what I see happening. So to answer that in a way, Zach, if you were to say, what do you think will happen with the Jewel Johnson? a contract debate relative to which one is more likely to be sporting the orange and blue next year. I actually think it's going to be Josie. It, yeah, I, I was going to make the same exact point. His injury, and it might sound callous, his injury really benefits the Broncos. He won't break the bank now. He can come back on a hometown deal, a prove-it deal, get-right deal, whatever phrase you want to use. And AJ, though, I mean, availability is the best availability is the best ability, Chad. So the fact he's on the field, he's he's the defensive play caller, wearing the green dot. He has the trust of Fangio. I think the organization would prefer him on a multi-year deal. But my answer to this is it depends on who's the coach of the Broncos next season. If it's Fangio, there's a good chance one or both return. If it's not Fangio, there's a chance that neither return. And I can definitely see someone like AJ or Josie, for that matter flocking right to New England. They're both Bill Belichick, stereotypical linebackers, and they would have a market in the NFL. I think Alexander a little more because he's healthy and still playing and productive. Travis, hey, appreciate you, bro. Good to see you in the chat. Good evening, Chad. Zach, Broncos country with Jewel out for the season. Do you possibly think they will start looking to bring someone in, even though we have depth? 
And what do you guys think about the rumblings about Elway and Manning being owners of the Broncos? You know, all those rumors, I mean, if anything, it makes you wonder when John Elway decided to step back from being the GM, how much of that was really him saying, all right, I had my my time at the plate, now it's time to let someone else, and how much of that was him being strong-armed by Joe Ellis from a PR perspective of, hey, someone's got to pay, you know. To, to Each and every year someone has paid, and it's the head coach, and the guy picking the head coach, time has come, and John fell on the sword, and you could do it plausibly uh, without actually cutting bait because you could say, all right, I'm stepping back from GM. I'm going upstairs. Remember, that's how he tried to posture it. I'm, you know, I had an opportunity to get promoted to just stay upstairs as president. Of football. No, come on now. We know that's that's probably not what happened. So what that hints to me, and this isn't me dropping any insider information. This is just my speculation, reading between the lines on this, Zach. John Elway still wants very much to be the man pulling the strings for the Denver Broncos. And there's no higher position in the Broncos hierarchy than owner. And he's been the GM. He was the quarterback. I mean, he's experienced every level of what it's been like to be a part of the Broncos fabric. And the last remaining piece for him is becoming owner. So I, there's going to be a lot of rumblings between now and the end of the year, the, the beginning of next year, when the court litigation starts stepping up. It could be a situation where there's an ownership group, like we've been hearing about. Could be Bezos steps in. Could be where a Bolin takes over. It's just so unclear right now. And until a little more time passes, it's all speculation to me. Kiaka, what's good, buddy? Great to see you. Can't wait to meet you in the flesh in just a few days' time. He says, I feel awful for Josie. People wanted him axed and are now crying he's gone for the year. See, that's the hypocritical nature of humanity, to be frank, but the the, the hypocritical nature of fanhood, to be, to be just as honest. Be careful what you wish for, peeps. Sternad and Browning must step up. Hashtag fire Tom McMahon for David Bruton. I didn't even know David – is David coaching special? I mean, he was a special teams ace for the Broncos, but I didn't know he's in coaching. I, I Kiaka, I would take you over Tom McMahon at this point. The guy has no business being a coordinator – at the NFL level. And I'm not exactly crying for Josie. If this was, you know, a, a, a more of an impact player, if it was Cortland Sutton or Javante or Teddy Bridgewater, yeah, that would be worth shedding tears about. But thank God, be happy. They don't have a no one at inside linebacker. They actually have two young guys they've been grooming specifically for this moment. I, for one, am excited to watch Sternod and Baron Browning and the opportunity. By the way, for what it's worth, the last thing I read on... Uh... David Bruton was that he entered education, which is what he was doing part time when he was struggling to stick on the Broncos roster during the off season. He took uh, teaching jobs. Last I heard, he settled in Cherry Creek somewhere doing something similar for what it's worth. Michael, dude, thank you so much for everything you do for Mile High Huddle, whether it's the Huddle Up podcast, Broncos for Breakfast, or any of the other podcasts. You're here every single day, every single night, supporting the cause, helping keeping these lights on. And we love you, dude. Thank you. He says, it's great to see Broncos country here on Mile High Huddle listening to Chad and Zach. Go Broncos uh, for life from Tucson, Arizona. One of these days, Michael, we'll, we'll find a way to uh, get you to our next meet and greet because it'll, it'll be great to meet you in the flesh. Yeah, and Michael is such a great Twitter follow. Every, after every single show, Chad, he's adding you, he's adding me, and wishing us, you know, and, and you know, uh, promoting us and and sending his appreciation. So, Michael, thank you so much. And Stu, wow. Zeus, the man. Stu, seriously, you as well, bro. You as well. I hope we get to see you on Sunday, Stu, uh, because, you know, that's something that both Zach and I, we won't be content till we check that off the old bucket list. Meeting Zeus in the flesh. That's right. Love you, bro. Throwing down on Facebook and on YouTube. Here's uh, Jake Gerard jumping in. Teddy Gunslinger Bridgewater. Yes, indeed. Zach, let me finish. We didn't finish that thought. Let me tell you the records, all right, that Teddy, uh, I don't know, not set, but the, the club he joined. Quote, this is from Zach's uh, article today with Sunday's victory at Jacksonville. Uh, PR Broncos Patrick Smythe reported Bridgewater became only the fourth quarterback in league history to record two plus passing touchdowns and no interceptions while completing at least 75% of his passes in each of his first two games of the season. The four quarterbacks that he joined in that club, Drew Brees, who did it in 2018, Aaron Rodgers, who did it in 2015, and Jeff George back in 1994, Zach. 
one of those things is not like the other. It's so weird to lump Jeff George in there with the rest. You know, we were talking about this before the show, Chad. It, it's commendable that he set that record. It, it's cool for uh, Broncos country. It's cool for Bridgewater and the team. But you have to keep in mind the opponents. He wasn't taking down Kansas City and San Francisco. He was taking down, you know, the Giants and the Jaguars. It's, it's again, commendable. But it seems like an overinflated stat through two weeks of the season. Kind of like going over the unbeaten teams through two weeks of the season. It's like it's so it's such an infant point. Let this season play out a little more, and then we'll we'll have a bigger sample size. Uh, before we grab King Days, um, Kenneth Booker didn't Al Wilson end his career on a special teams play? Yeah, unfortunately, it was one of those weird. It was a freak thing. He wasn't the guy at the point of attack. Gerard Warren, the big defensive tackle, if I remember this right, was going for the for the uh, ball carrier, and just it was friendly fire careened into Al and his head got snapped back at an unnatural angle. And it was that neck too, too sketchy. Although Al Wilson for a long time, the reason he's only just recently hitting the ring of fame is because he didn't feel like the Broncos medical staff handled his injury uh, and his prognosis and everything the right way. But yes, you're right on that. Um, King days. Hey guys, I left a super chat a couple weeks back when Teddy was named starter. You guys read the first part, but didn't even read or acknowledge the second part. Maybe you guys were just, I need syntax. In your feelings, which is not the case. Maybe we had other things going on, other topics to address, other questions to address. It's not like us to selectively choose what parts to read King Day. So uh, if you're trying to dunk on us, that's great. We've acknowledged how good Teddy Bridgewater has played, and we haven't issued any hate toward him at all. We've been on the Teddy Bridgewater train, so... I don't know what uh, narrative you're trying to push there. Listen up, Broncos country. Tick Pick should be your first choice to buy football tickets because they save fans money by never charging any service fees ever. Tick Pick is the exclusive ticketing partner for the Huddle Up podcast and the Blue Wire Network. Denver Broncos football is finally back, and there's no need to exhaust yourself searching all over the internet to find Broncos tickets anymore because Tick Pick, that's T I C K. P-I-C-K is the original no-fee ticket site and the only one you'll ever need as your go-to for all NFL tickets. TickPick got rid of all those awful service fees that the other ticket sites charge, which lets them guarantee the best prices on all of their NFL tickets. Don't believe it? If you can find better prices for the same seats on another ticket site, TickPick will give you 110% of the difference in the purchase price. That's right, guys. When we were searching for tickets for the MHH meet and greet for week three at home, Broncos versus Jets. Tick Pick had us locked down. So visit TickPick.com slash huddle today and use the promo code huddle to save $10 on your first order of Broncos tickets. Uh, Lawrence wants to know, and thank you for the stars, brother. I was just, and also King Days, thank you for that uh, super chat support. I was just wondering who we're going to shuffle around to replace Josie. Uh, who's some good free agents or are we good? Zach, I can pull up spot track, but I have not yet really looked around to see. But listen, I think no for one. now, Zach, they're going to look in-house. You've got two recent yeah. draft picks and Justin Sternod, who's ready to go, played, you know, finished last week second on the team in tackles. And then you've got Baron Browning, who is still very much, you know, uh, percolating, marinating. He's not quite ready to be thrust onto the big stage, but he is depth. He's a very talented, phenomenal athlete. And then you've got, Every time I say this dude's name, I think of the movie The Sitter with the uh, with Jonah Hill, uh, Jonas Griffith. Right? Noah Griffith is the character I'm talking about from that movie. Anyway, if you guys have seen the movie, you'll know why I'm why I'm thinking that. You've got some options. You've got some horses, Zach, and I think they'll look there first. They might make like a bubble guy type acquisition. I don't think you're going to see him go out there and swing for the fences on some big name that might be languishing out there on the wire. If they do bring in someone, it's someone they've had previous. Uh, familiarity with and I was looking over the free agent inside linebackers earlier today and remember Peter Columbai Chad the Broncos mm -hmm. had him on the roster for a cup of coffee he yep. might come back because he knows the system he's cheap depth you know a, a warm body to have at the position but no they don't make any trades don't bring in a veteran let those young guys absorb the reps let the young guys grow and develop I'm looking at Sternod. I'm looking at Baron Browning. Again, that's the reason they brought him in. That's the reason they've invested draft picks and time for this moment right now. All right, here we go from Simon Weeb up in Canada, north of the 49th parallel, proving Broncos country 
It's not a geographic location. It's a state of being. Hello, MHH. Wow, bittersweet start to the season. 2-0, and but injuries are wiping out the roster. Always had a soft spot for Jewel, and losing Chubb is brutal. Will Payton be looking for free agents still on the couch? I mean, we know at all times they're they're looking to upgrade the roster when and wherever possible. But you've also got uh, a couple of linebackers on practice squad. So my gut is telling me if they do anything from outside the building, it's what Zach just said. Peter Com- Kayamba. How is it? What? How do you say it? Kalambayi. Kalambayi. More so than anything else. But really, this is about hold on for dear life with Justin Sternad in hopes that he too can stay healthy. Because I think, you know, you get him some live bullet reps. You, I know, and these are games that count. You wish you could have had a little bit more experience like in preseason games for him. But he did get a lot of action there this summer. This is it, man. Hey, it's one of the um, bittersweet aspects of NFL is that, look, oftentimes it's injury and tragedy that creates the biggest opportunity that sees guys go from role players or backups to becoming stars on the big stage. So who knows if that's what awaits Justin Sternod, but Broncos drafted him for a reason. And were it not Zach for a relatively concerning injury jacket, he was a guy that a lot of draft Knicks pegged as an early day two pick, you know, he would have gone probably somewhere late round two round three if he didn't have the injury history at Wake Forest, he ended up going in round five. So this dude's got length. He is a freaking athlete. So now it's just a matter of time on task. What's one of the foundational aspects of the NFL, though? That would be next man up. And when you have that next man, you're in a good position. The Broncos actually have two. And you have to ask yourself, what are they really losing in Josie Jewell? Are they a, a run stopper? That's the number one thing they're, they're losing when, when he's out of the game with him on the sideline. But you have players like Von Miller, who's adept at stopping the run. Malik Reed is a great run stopper. We mentioned Kareem Jackson. Alexander Johnson, that's his forte. You see where I'm going with this? The Broncos' run, de- the Broncos defense is geared more so to stop the run than the pass. They can do both. But they have so many players that are so good near the line of scrimmage. That's why they held the Jaguars to what? I think it was 50 yards a little more than 50 yards yesterday, at least when I checked in the fourth quarter. So if that's the biggest loss, Josie Jewell, it's not really his, I would say, leadership. It's not really anything more than his run-stuffing ability. Thank God they have another inside linebacker who's completely adept at that. And between two young guys in Sternod and Baron Browning, they need one capable guy to cover running backs and tight ends, and I think they'll have that. It could be a blessing in disguise. Sucks for Josie, but if they get better covering players in coverage, if they get better covering tight ends, so be it. Uh, Not to pick nits in what you said. I think the biggest thing I'm worried about in losing uh, losing Josie Jewell is, you know, it wasn't Alexander Johnson that Fangio and Donatel trusted as the signal caller with the mic in the helmet or the speaker in the helmet. It was Josie Jewell. So when he went out, AJ took over that role. Fangio said today that, you know, it was fine. You did okay. But there's a reason why that went to Josie and not AJ. So as long as AJ can hold up in that department and competently call those signals, make sure everyone's lined up the work. I mean, you've got guys like Justin Simmons, all pro veteran, and Kareem Jackson on the back end to also be kind of your fail safe to make sure guys know their jobs and are lined up correctly. But that's the one thing Zach bothered me at the back of my mind. I mean, when AJ took over, though, uh, I, I didn't see a downturn in the Broncos' production. They actually got better in the second half with Josie out of the game, and that's you know maybe no coincidence there. And also, like Von Miller said, AJ had the green dot, but he said even Sternod can wear it. He's capable, too. So I, I, it, that, to me, his biggest loss is the run stopping, and they have plenty of other players that can make up for that. Trevor Pierce, what's good, buddy? Thank you for that super. He says, I know this has probably already been said, 10 times, but damn, guys, I was pissed when I saw Chubb out there. How long is this decision going to cost the team? We don't know yet, buddy. Wish we could tell you. Um, Haven't heard anything from my peeps. Fangio, I'll tell you what he said today on that topic. Um, On uh, if Chubb's going to be forced to miss time, I don't know yet. And according to – that's what he said. And then he also said, quote, his ankle acted up again. He tried to go with it. He had medical clearance, and he wanted to do it, and then acted up again. Uh, and then any thoughts of not playing Chubb last week because of, you know, out of an abundance of caution. 
I love it when people say that. Why don't you say as a precaution out of an abundance of caution? Anyway, not really because the medical staff thought it was basically going to be the same yesterday as it would have been next Sunday. They felt good about letting him play. He felt good about playing. So we played. So it's frustrating. You know, unfortunately, coaches and medical staffs don't have a crystal ball. If the player's saying I'm good and the medical staff signs off on it, hey, man, it's just crappy luck. And, um, you know, in a perfect world, hindsight being 2020, yeah, you, w- you maybe would have wished you could go back in time and say, Chubb, you're sitting this one out. But if what Fangio said was true, Zach, and the medical staff didn't think by this time next week it'd be any different than it is today, in other words, if he's going to play this year, he's just going to have to go out there and test the ankle. What are you going to do? I, I don't care what the medical staff has to say. I really don't care what Chubb has to say. What else is he going to say? I want to sit out. He's going to want to play. But Fangio being the head coach, he has to look at him and say to himself, okay, rationally, can we beat the Jaguars without Bradley Chubb? Can we get by this team without one player? And it's more or less relying on the intuition that I wish Fangio had, his gut instinct, instead of listening to everyone else and the analytics and the data if you're taking his ankle down to game time warmups and it's soggy and rainy and it's an inferior team, you have to make an executive decision to hold him out for one more week, regardless of what anyone's telling you. That's why you're the head coach. Head coach. You're the leader of men. It's time to exert yourself in that fashion. Here is an update on the stars for tonight's live stream. Samisi jumping in with a tied record. I don't, maybe this is the limit, Zach, that Facebook sets on stars. Kind of YouTube has one. Maybe this is what the stars one is. There's now, I think, four people that have been that generous to MHH on the stars front. Samisi, I think we all know who we're talking about here. Appreciate you very much. Michael, man, you're balling. Thank you, bro. Zeus, love you. Randy, Gary, Travis, Andrew. And by the way, Randy, that's a flex, my dog. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Baker, Travis Weber, Claude Riley, Lawrence Rivera, David Wilder. Thanks to each and every one of you. We'll do one last stars update at the end of the show. But man, Zach, we are just spoiled. Our community, our our audience, our friends, these people that we care about. It's just sometimes we got to pinch ourselves. A lot. It happens a lot. You guys are the greatest. I say that to myself every single day. I say on Twitter. I say it on here. Broncos country is the best. Thank you all. David Wilder says, I really hope Vince Garcia and Tom McMahon will be fired soon. Vince is kind of who took over for the Greek as the guy on the field medical staff. Uh, Denver Box for life. Mile high huddle. Let him hate. Uh, and then Howie freaking day. What's up, guys? Great start so far. I really like Javante Williams run style. How do you think we will fare in the near future without injuries? Yeah, man. It's hard to say because those guys were starters for a reason. And we've been talking about one of the things that's different about this year's club, even compared to just last year, is when when guys started going down last year, Zach, the depth just was not there. And they paid an immediate price from Drew going down week two with Jeff Driscoll to, uh, I mean, you can't really, I mean, losing Sutton hurt, but they had two rookies in Judy and KJ that were forced into more action. Timmy P ended up being the biggest beneficiary of Sutton going down. It would have been nice for Drew to have something last year, but I don't think that was the the injury that really cost the team the most. Vaughn Miller, right? Not having Vaughn on the field on defense. The cornerback injuries that just kept happening game after game. Last year, the, the depth wasn't there. This year, they have depth, but it, that only gets you so far, Zach. How long can you keep whistling past the graveyard? Because eventually, when you're going from one starter to another and another and another, we're trying to replace key contributors and, and just guys that the coaches rely on. Eventually, the chicken comes home to roost. So the question is, how long can they get by if, indeed, this is just going to kind of be the another story of 2021, similar to last year? That's why you have to beat the opponents that you should beat and stack your wins when you can. It's so important that yep. the Broncos got to 2-0 and o because if they do blow a game later in the year because of injuries, they can afford to. Thank God George Payton restocked the cupboards. Like Von Miller said, he said it's it, George Payton's done a fantastic job keeping the depth, you know, um, lined up at every position. So injuries are a part of the game. 
And it's unfortunate the Broncos have had really bad injury luck the last three, four, five years, but it is part of the game, and all we have to do is be thankful. They lose Josie Jewell, they have Cortland Sutton. They, Excuse me, they, Jerry Judy, they have Cortland Sutton. They lose Josie Jewell, they have Baron Browning. I mean, they lose Ronald Darby, they have Patrick Sertan. That could be a lot worse, and it's actually making the Broncos, considering the replacements are better than the starters in some cases, a lot better. I got to credit Scott Kennedy for this one. He says, hopefully some of these guys will be coming back, lose a starter, get one back. See what he means by that, right? You know, sometimes guys emerge into roles that you didn't maybe realize they had in them, right? They perform at a level that you might not have realized, and then the guy they replaced came back. Now it's a smorgasbord. It's an embarrassment of riches. Trevor jumping in. What's up, brother? Tedham hate? Zach, is it growing on you yet? So if Teddy beats the Ravens and Steelers, then will you embrace the Tedham hate? I mean, I'm kind of embracing it now. He's playing phenomenal football, but I'm keeping it in perspective that he's playing phenomenal football against the Jaguars and the Giants. Come week four, I mean, look what the Ravens did last night, taking down Kansas City. That was a tremendous game. If Teddy does that again and goes toe-to-toe with Lamar and comes out on top, I'll be downing all the crow I can handle, Chad. But through two weeks, let's pump the brakes a little bit. I see Super Bowl aspirations and these declarations of Teddy being the long-term quarterback. Guys, let's let it play out a little longer, please. Here's one. Uh... From Claude. Again, thank you, Claude. So far, so good. Injuries are unfortunate. By the way, I'm going to grab Claude, and then I'm going to grab something here that Zach Trahill is saying, and then Travis Tarbox. Uh, Injuries are unfortunate, but our GM has done a great job making sure we have depth across the board. Let's keep on trucking. Get that 3-0 on Sunday. Have a great time at the meet and greet, everyone. I'll be with you in spirit. Go Broncos. Man, wish you could be there, Claude, but as they say, We'll pour one out for you in the best sense, right? We'll, 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 here's a better way to put it. We'll uh, raise one up to Claude Riley. Trust on that. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Zach Trahill, what's up with Dalton Reisner early in the season, but same problems as last year. He needs to improve before that week four stretch uh, might get ugly up the middle. Zach, on this topic, by the time Eric Trickle gets on his own microphone for his own show on Fridays, people don't really want to talk about last week, right? They want to talk about the next game. And yet his grades come out immediately following the game. I got to read to you a few of these uh, grades that he had from the game. And this is a grading system that he's perfected over almost a decade of doing this now. But here's what he said, Zach. Listed in the ne- among the negative was left guard Dalton Reisner with a putrid 29.3 grade. To give you guys perspective, every player in the system starts out with a grade of 50. And as each snap happens, if it's a good play, that grade climbs. If it's a bad play, it declines, right? So you want to see a good performance as anything kind of in the 70s all the way up to the 90s. That's where like you're like, that dude balled out. 29.3 from Dalton Reisner, horrendous. Here's what Eric said. There is a significant disparity with the perception of Reisner and his performance in reality. The third-year guard has struggled since arriving as a second-round pick in 2019 and is progressively getting worse. The career worst showing came against the Jaguars, including a play where he basically did not move as he got beat. Now, Zach, we can come back to some of these things, but I thought the way he put that, the perception of Reisner relative to his actual performance on the field, there's a disparity there. There's a gap. And at a certain point, it's got to start to concern Broncos country. And I got to tell you that I'm at that point. I'm wondering dude, is this guy ever going to like live up to the expectations, to his talk, to his bluster? Because I love Dalton Reisner, and I think he's really good for this team. Even when he's not playing great, Zach, he's a really good leader and just an emotional rah-rah guy for the dudes. But when is his play on the field going to be commensurate with that? Well, this is the problem because I mentioned about overinflating Teddy's first two starts a little bit in the hyperbole. Everyone thought that Dalton Reisner was the next Hall of Fame left guard for Denver. He was the next Ring of Famer. He was still a young developing guy, and it was recency bias. They jumped out to a hot start, with at least with Drew Locke in the later half of the season in 2019, and you saw a future linchpin of the OL in Reisner, the future quarterback in Drew Locke, and he had a kind of a downturn in 2020. I wonder, though, is it because he's stationed in between Garrett Bowles, who's playing mostly phenomenal football again, and Lloyd Cushenberry, who's still getting no credit despite I haven't heard his name through two weeks. Cushenberry is one of the most improved players on the team, like some of us have been predicting. So I wonder if it's because 
if he's like the black sheep now, if he's the weakest link on the O-line. Even Bobby Massey played well at right tackle. Moody held his own at right guard. So did Glasgow in week one. Now you have to wonder, is Reisner the worst player on the Broncos front five? I still think it's Lloyd Cushenberry. Like I predicted that Lloyd would take a step this year. It depends on who you ask, all right? I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you guys and pretend like I go back and break down every single snap, see how each guy does. I I wish I had time to do that. I don't. That's why we have guys like Eric and everybody else that breaks things down uh, on the nuts and bolts side of things for us, okay? But Lloyd Cushenberry, everything I've read up to this point as far as his grades, whether you look at PFF, I mean, Eric gave him a – what is it? He gave him a uh, – 30.0 grade, barely, barely better than Dalton Reisner. I think that those guys just, they got to turn it around. Either way, that that interior needs to turn the ship around. Travis Tarbox says, I watched your show after the fact, Chad. You pretty much answered my question. If Teddy keeps this going, will he end up being a long-term answer? Zach, this is something I kind of grasped at in that article I talked about today uh, where I fell on the sword, ate some crow for, on the Teddy front. And the topic was, hey, look, one of the reasons why you and I were uh, highly skeptical of Fangio's decision is it felt very self-serving. It felt like a coach trying to preserve his job, sacrificing the long-term well-being of the team and what could be with a young, talented Q like Drew uh, for expediency in the short term, in the present, because you and I, we did not view Teddy Bridgewater in any way, shape or form as a plausible candidate to be the future franchise guy. And yet he's only 28 years old. I say only in that, you know, he's not a spring chicken, but he's not old, old either. Like he has a serious window of time left where he could he could be an impact player if he continues on this trend. Part of my realization as I'm writing out this article, Zach, is that if Teddy continues on this trajectory, and that is an if, he becomes a plausible candidate to be the future franchise guy. But as you said, Zach, before we can put that cart before, you know, we don't want to put the cart before the horse because – Let's see him go against some truly formidable opponents like Baltimore in week four. Is it Pittsburgh week five? I mean, I think we'll have a little bit better grasp of some of the answers on this once we get into that second quarter of the season. You know, I'm reminded of Denny Green. He goes, you know, you want to crown them, crown their asses then. That's how I feel about Teddy Bridgewater and the Broncos collective now. Long-term answer, Super Bowl aspirations again. He's looked phenomenal. I mean, I literally could not ask for more out of Teddy Bridgewater the first couple weeks of the season. He's exceeded every expectation I had and every expectation I didn't know I had, Chad. Yep. That being said, though, can we let it play out a little longer? Let it at least week four with Baltimore. Chad mentioned Pittsburgh, the Kansas City games. Hell, even the Raiders, who are looking phenomenal right now. They just upset Pittsburgh. Let the, the quality opponent approve improve and if teddy still holds up then yeah we can have that conversation right now it's not worth having uh nathan hey thank you bro for the super he wants to know any chance we're going to get flexed to sunday night football anytime soon anytime soon no is there a chance late in the season once the playoff picture starts resolving and teams who are currently right. scheduled on sunday night football are no longer a team anyone wants to watch on a nationally televised broadcast maybe for now i'm telling you Move into the season, move forward, and thank you, uh, Stu, for the super chat. How's it? Uh, move forward in this season under the full expectation that you're not getting a primetime game for the Broncos this year. And if you end up getting surprised, hey, yeah, that's a silver lining development. But do we want a primetime game? Historically, they haven't been good in those situations. I almost rather a Sunday afternoon game and just let the Broncos play who's in front of them and when it's in front of them. Um, okay, we are at. 52 minutes. Uh, Claude, jumping in again. Thank you, bro. We all remember Reisner tossing Philip Lindsay. By the way, Philip Lindsay, another productive day for the Texans, uh, into you, the end zone in Green you, Bay. Do you know, Chad, he actually caught a pass for a touchdown? He actually, Yo. his hands Yo. actually grasped the football, and he held on to it, and he scored a touchdown. I didn't Shut think it could be done. Shut the front door. So I've could, heard. Could it be? It's just cool to see him doing well, you know? I wish you, they, they could have found a way to keep him around, but whatever. Uh, Claude, we all remember Reisner tossing Phil into the end zone. That was the Green Bay game. Uh, he's been riding that wave ever since. Great guy. I hope he has a Garrett Bowles-like transformation. Go Broncos. 
that's about what you have to hope for at this point. He hasn't been a categorical, you know, perpetrator <laughs> relative to relative to, you know, getting the the yellow laundry and penalties like Bowles became infamous for. But his play, I mean, Bowles in when he wasn't holding and tackling guys, Bowles as a left tackle was actually pretty good. I can't say the same thing about Reisner up to this point. Like he's had a few moments and you know, he's a very heads up type player, very smart, very savvy, but nothing to write home about really as far as body of work. Yeah. You know, when he's not holding and tackling, you know, how'd you like to play Mrs. Lincoln? It's like, it reminds me of that. I, you, you, I got to slow down. I got to pump the brakes a little bit though on the Dalton Reisner hate. Some of you guys are regarding him like the Michael Schofields and the Max Garcias and the Alan Barbers of the last couple of years. He is still a very, very high quality starting caliber right or left guard. And I wonder, Chet, is the scheme a problem? Is he not getting meshed well with Mike Munchak? Maybe the scheme suited Garrett Bowles well, and once he learned it, that's where he became a top three left tackle. I still have high hopes for Dalton. I think uh, he'll improve as the Broncos go on. He's the least of my concerns right now. You know, I'm uh, I'm concerned, but I'm not like running to the cliff on Dalton Reisner because I think he's smart enough and he's got a big enough heart and he's getting the best coaching you could possibly get. If there's been anything astray on this whole thing with Reisner, it's that maybe the Broncos were wrong when they said, we're drafting a career right tackle and going to play him at left guard. Right. Maybe he should have stayed at tackle. Uh, Luke, are you guys worried about the lack of point production if you take Gordon's 70-yard Touchdown in week one off. We are averaging 21 and a half points. Zach, we don't really like that no. whole comparison of nope. if you remove this, then right. you get that. Well, you got that. You got the 70 yarder. You got the points. All you can do, I mean, would it have mattered? Would it have meant more to you in that equation, Luke, if it would have been a steady, you know, 80 yard drive and then Gordon gets a one yard touchdown at the end and then now you're not worried about it, right? Think about that. They got the, they got the big play. So it, it factors into the equation. You can't take that away from them. They got it. Um, I think, Zach, you know, these first two weeks, opponents, the Giants and the Jags, they really sold out to stop the run. They loaded the box. And what do you do when that happens? You got to make them pay for it. And Teddy has done that. Thank the football gods. So what's going to happen? I think you'll start seeing that this week. You're not going to see as many loaded boxes. And then what happens is those five, six, seven-yard decent runs you've seen from Melvin and from Pookie. Now they're breaking them off because there's not that extra one or two bodies in the box. That is going to happen so long as Teddy continues to make teams pay for being dishonest relative to, uh, you know, the box. You know, although I think the Gordon touchdown was kind of like an outlier, Chad, because that's not common for the new age Melvin Gordon. And he didn't do much yesterday against the Jaguars. And Jacksonville's run defense is a lot worse than the Giants' is. But you can't take that away. It's part of the game. And we are all aching and moaning and complaining for big plays, explosive plays. Not only did Melvin Gordon rip off a 70-yarder, it was the fastest run by any player in Week 1. It was a very impressive play. I don't really commend Melvin Gordon all that too often. So, no, you know, if my aunt had cashews, Chad, she'd be my uncle. I, I don't ever like playing the <laughs> what-if game at all. And especially when it comes to football. That's a good one. You know, I think the, the thing that that you've said tonight that resonates the most with me as your co-host is when, when fans, as the, everyone's fretting and there's lots of hand-wringing, and justifiably so, over all the injuries, right? How long can we continue to get by with this many studs dropping? Well, the big difference between this year and last year is the Broncos have overcome them in the short term. They've won the games they're supposed to win. So that gives them a little bit of rope. That gives them a little bit of... Uh, you know, leniency to have a game that they lose here and there uh, and then get those guys back and then get right back into the swing of things. That's so true. And that's one of the reasons why, as I talked about in my piece today, go read the column, Teddy Bridgewater, his impact on the team hasn't just been in the box score, the stats. It's been on an emotional, almost spiritual level, intangibles. That's all we heard about Teddy when he landed here, right? All oh, the leadership and all that. And hey, we I think in this particular case, we just didn't expect after what we'd seen from him in the last few years in the league, we didn't expect to see his production on the field match that level of leadership. And so far it has. Praise the football gods. 
let's hope that continues because that emotional shift we've seen in the team, that's going to allow them to continue overcoming obstacles that this same squad in years past exactly. would have fallen short of the mark. They would have withered. Exactly. Yeah, it's such a great point because his intangibles are matching his tangibles now. And the numbers he's putting up, Chad, throwing for over 300 yards, two touchdowns, we knew he'd be a good leader. We knew he'd be a safe mostly turnover-free quarterback, but when he's putting up those stats and making some of these throws, it's it's beyond what either of us and many others in Broncos country thought was possible. And the longer that continues, the longer the Broncos can keep winning. All right, guys. Uh, we It's about time for us to get on out of here. Before we do, I'm going to have Zach go through um, our matters of business. we got to remind you to check out BetQL. Go download the app on uh, the App Store or Google Play. And you can find BetQL's information in the description of this YouTube video, along with the code, the discount code MHH, to get 25% off their tools, their subscriptions uh, at checkout. It's going to allow you to beat your bookie on a game in, game out basis. And then also don't forget that special BetMGM offer in the same description to receive a free year of BetQL and other sportsbook sign-up offers and bonuses. Zach, if you wouldn't mind starting the uh, the rundown, yes, I'm going to grab the update on stars and then we'll we'll say goodnight to everybody. Yes, sir. This was the Huddle Up Pod, guys. And until we see you guys next time, which will be Wednesday evening, be sure to follow the Huddle Up Pod on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can follow the main account for all your Broncos news, analysis, rumors, film breakdowns, transactions, and so much more at a Mile High Huddle. You can follow Chad on Twitter. If it will pull back up, I guess it won't. At Chad and Jensen. You can follow myself at Kelberman NFL. If you haven't already, go to huddleoutpod.com. Get yourself a dad hat. Get yourself a football, football priest hat, football priest shirt, a gator, hoodie, anything and everything you can think of or fathom is in that store. If you haven't, go to facebook.com slash huddle. Hit that big blue button. Become a supporter today. You get instant access to our VIP content. Kelberman's Corner, Trickle Zone, Broncos Book Club, we appreciate each and every viewer for those programs. Also, Facebook.com slash Pod, Like that page. And if you haven't, go to Apple Podcasts and leave your football priest a five-star review for a chance to win some swag each and every month. But if you can't do that, we totally appreciate it. Understand, just do these three things. Subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. Helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like you. All right, guys. Before we uh, officially dip on out, look at this. Michael Ronquillo, not to be outdone, finishes the day atop the Facebook stars charts. Thank you, bro. Really appreciate that generosity. Uh, Samisi right there behind him. Zeus, Randy Jones, love you. Travis, Gary, Andrew Baker, Claude Riley, Travis Weber, David Wilder, and Lawrence Rivera. Thanks to each and every one of you. Much love. Seriously, you guys, it's very helpful, everything you're doing to support the cause. It's allowing this content to continue and uh, we just we appreciate you Zach real quick on the topic of the uh, podcast reviews on Apple shout out to whoever Y.O. Colby is but hey appreciate that five-star review he says Chad and Zach put on a great pod they actually care about all their listeners and are very knowledgeable they make it fun to participate do giveaways and even a meet and greet at a game this year very 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 Thank sweet five-star appreciate that my friend we're going to give away some swag randomly selected to to the people who did put up star or uh, five star reviews on Apple Pods in the month of September. Now that the football season is rolling. We will do that at the end of this month. So if you guys want a chance to to be in that drawing, go drop a five star review on the Huddle Up Podcast on Apple Pods. And with that, Zach, sign us off, bro. Love you guys. We'll see you Wednesday night. Yes, sir, Chad. Have a great rest of your night. Be sure to. Uh, Broncos for breakfast tomorrow morning, yep. and then tomorrow night is building the Broncos, I believe, if I have my schedule down yep. correctly. We are off, though, until Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. We'll see you guys then to get you ready for week three, a game, Chad, that will be at the meet and greet at uh, Empower Field, the Broncos home opener. To quote Vic Fangio, it's going to be lit. We can't wait to see you guys there and uh, have fun. But we, until Wednesday, guys, take care, and as always, go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.